the height of the Vietnam War, a U.S. Special Forces camp is overrun in a fierce armored attack. Eight Green Berets are trapped inside an underground bunker. Their only hope of survival, their fellow Green Berets. Outmanned and outgunned, a small band of commandos plot a daring rescue mission. It will take patience, cunning, and courage to get past the enemy. The lives of eight men depend on it. In an era of global violence, a new breed of warrior has emerged to counter the threat. Superbly trained, fearless, and equipped with massive firepower, these men are an elite few. Their teams are hand-picked, their operations covert, their missions deadly. From around the globe, these are the untold stories of the Special Forces. On January 31st, 1968, North Vietnam violated a truce during Tet, the Vietnamese New Year. The NVA, or North Vietnamese Army, launched shock attacks on several key cities and provinces in South Vietnam. Within 24 hours, the U.S. Embassy in Saigon had fallen to enemy invaders. Khe San, a U.S. Marine base just south of the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, was pounded by NVA artillery. The NVA gunners struck with incredible precision. A direct hit on an ammo dump wiped out 90% of Quezon's stores. President Lyndon Johnson was determined to hold the strategic base. If Quezon fell, the enemy would cross the DMZ and carry the fight into the populated coastal regions of South Vietnam. Johnson ordered the 6,600 Marines stationed at Quezon to prepare for one of the largest battles of the war. Caught in the crosshairs of the invasion was a small special forces camp called Long Ve. 24 Green Berets operated out of the forward border camp. Their mission, to train and lead 400 indigenous South Vietnamese troops on covert operations. Franklin Dooms was a radio operator at Long Ve. Well, we were uh, primarily force multipliers. Uh, that means that uh, we would take 12 men uh, and train thousands, if need be, to, uh, to conduct operations. The South Vietnamese troops who fought alongside the Green Berets were from the Civilian Irregular Defense Guard, or SIG. For these local soldiers, the war was personal. They had to protect their homes and families from the NVA. By day, the Green Berets trained the Sige in modern combat. By night, they led them on recon patrols into hostile territory. Our job was to monitor infiltration from North Vietnam. Uh, we were more of a reconnaissance type unit to, to keep people informed as to what's going on on the borders of Laos and North Vietnam border. Operating deep within enemy territory, the Green Berets were prime targets. They never wore rank insignia or dog tags, and they removed any personal effects that could be exploited by enemy propaganda. The risk of death or capture was extremely high. The patrols were under constant attack. Sergeant Richard Allen was a combat medic stationed at Long Vey. Every day, we'd, we'd send a patrol out, they would come in contact with the NVA. So it was every day, if you sent anybody any in any given direction, there was an, an immediate uh, response with the NVA. Long Vey's covert mission made it a priority for enemy troops. First Lieutenant Paul Longrier was stationed at Long Vey twice he understood the strategic importance of the camp. It had a history of launching uh, patrols into uh, uh, secret areas or classified areas. And um, 
it uh, was a, a place that harassed the enemy, and they wanted to get rid of it. As the Tet invasion intensified, the NVA focused on Khe Sanh, but Longvay's vulnerability became more apparent to Staff Sergeant Dennis Thompson as each day passed. If you looked at the situation map, there was uh, Khe Sanh Combat Base, Hill 861, Hill 881 North and South, and uh, Longvay in blue, and everything around it was in red. Oh, that's, you write up the enemy units in red. And if you looked at that map, there were just a few little blue spots in this sea of red. The situation was becoming critical. Quezon Marine Combat Base was assigned to protect Long Vey in the event of an attack. But Quezon was in trouble. 20,000 enemy troops were closing in on their perimeter. Long Vey went on high alert. Sergeant Thompson led a recon patrol of Sid's troops a few miles from camp. As they neared the Haipong River, the patrol found something that would change the course of the entire war. We found uh, underwater bridges. You know, they pile the rocks up underwater. So they're about six or eight inches below the water, but it's a roadway to support a heavy vehicle. Thompson searched for tracks he needed to know what kind of vehicles had been using the secret roadway. On the banks of the river, he found an infantryman's worst nightmare. The distinct imprint of tank tracks. If tanks were running in their sector, Long Vey would be their prime target. They had nothing in their camp to defend against heavy armor. Sergeant Thompson returned to Long Vey at dawn to report his findings to the camp commander. He headed straight for the TOC, or Tactical Operations Center. The TOC was an underground bunker that housed the camp's headquarters. Sir? Me and my boys just got back from recon. Up in this area right here. Captain Frank Willoughby, Long Vey's commanding officer, was surprised by Thompson's report. In 20 years of conflict, the North Vietnamese had never used tanks in battle. A battalion of Allied Laotians arrived at Old Long Vey, a smaller outpost at the bottom of the hill. This camp was run by Green Beret medics Sergeant First Class Eugene Ashley and Sergeant Richard Allen, who provided medical assistance to the troops. The Laotian battalion commander confirmed the Green Beret's worst fears. I said, why are you here? And he said, well, we got defeated in a tank battle with the uh, North Vietnamese Army. And I kind of looked back through the, the ranks and all these guys are wearing nice uh, uniforms. There's no bandages. The weapons aren't banged up or anything. And I said, uh, well, it doesn't look like you, you did too much fighting. And he said, uh, well, you know, there was a bunch of them and they had tanks. Captain Willoughby contacted 5th Special Forces Command at Da Nang to report tank activity in the area. The Army was skeptical of the report. Nobody had ever seen the NVA use tanks. I think the, the command element was very uh, apprehensive of Green Berets, and we were going out in places where they didn't go, and we were reporting stuff that they didn't report and didn't see and didn't encounter, and I think there were some credibility questions on their part. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Shungle, a Special Forces commander, flew in from Da Nang to assess the situation. According to Long Vey's executive officer, First Lieutenant Miles Wilkins, the camp was not equipped to battle tanks. When you take that tracked vehicle, all of the stuff that's typically used to stop people from attacking you, claymores, concertina, wire, you know, barbed wire all around your camp, all that type of stuff, is totally ineffectual against a tracked vehicle of that size. It just rolls over top of any, anything. If you're in a bunker, it can roll right over top of it. As a precautionary measure, Captain Willoughby had a hundred light anti-tank weapons airdropped into the camp. Known as LAWS, the experimental shoulder-launched rockets were portable and disposable. They could only be fired once. If there were tanks in the area, 
the Green Berets hoped the laws would be enough to stop them. We had a bunch of laws, light anti-tank weapons. Uh, they'd never been used before against tanks. This was the first time in the, in the history of the weapon that they were ever used. So we, we thought we were okay for a couple of tanks. The laws were stashed in strategic locations throughout the camp. As the Tet Offensive threatened to engulf Long Vey, the Green Berets remained on full alert. On February 6th, something, or somebody, tripped warning flares outside the camp perimeter. It might have been a false alarm. The flares were frequently set off by the wind or by wild animals. The men fired into the surrounding brush. They waited for return fire. There was none. Inside the talk, Captain Willoughby and Lieutenant Wilkins heard an ominous rumbling. The ground began to shake. When the next trip flare went off, they were under attack. I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I knew that there were searchlights coming toward us, which is unusual. We've never seen searchlights come at us. The NVA attacked with surprising fury. The North Vietnamese, who usually relied on guerrilla tactics, now advanced behind Soviet-built tanks. The support unit stationed at Old Long Bay was alerted by the firefight. Sergeant Ashley and Sergeant Allen scrambled into position. Even from a half mile away, they could see the main camp was in trouble. So all you can just see is that you know the tracer rounds, the green versus red tracer rounds, and you're hearing, hearing people yelling and screaming. The bullets are whizzing everywhere. You can't sink low enough into the dirt. You just hear the cries of people being shot and as they're crying out and the explosions from the, the uh, guns from the tanks. That's just mass chaos. It is just, it's like the picture of Dante's Inferno. Inside the talk, men armed themselves with the laws. Jacksonville. As the tanks stormed the camp, Lieutenant Paul Longrier tried to stop them with one of the shoulder-launched rockets. It misfired. Longrier feared the laws had been damaged when they were airdropped into camp. But these weapons were Long Vey's only hope of fending off the attack. After two misfires, the third law fired. You could actually see the tail of it go headed toward the tank, and it, and it hit, boom! And instead of exploding and penetrating, it went, and shot straight up in the air. And that's when we looked at each other and said, uh-oh, something's wrong. And uh, so that got the tank's attention because I hit near where the driver was. And so the tank stopped and went, mm, started moving his main gun. And we said, uh, hey, time to get out of this bunker. Let's get out of here! At Old Long Vey, Sergeants Ashley and Allen watched in horror as the North Vietnamese tanks assaulted the main camp. Now. If they didn't get reinforcements soon, Long Vey was doomed. On February 6, 1968, enemy tanks attacked Long Vey Special Forces Camp on the northernmost border of South Vietnam. Franklin Dooms radioed the Marine base in nearby Khe Sanh for help. 
The code word for Quezon was Jacksonville. Jacksonville, be advised we are under heavy attack. We have tanks inside the wire. Request illumination, over. Longvay needed Quezon to fire flares so they could target the tanks. I called and stated that we have tanks in the wire and we need illumination. That was what, I, that was what they were asking for. Uh, goes dead. Uh, Quezon didn't answer. <laughs> he got quiet. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how much time had lapsed, but they came back and says, would you describe the vehicles? And they were talking about the tanks, and I, I couldn't describe them. I didn't even know what they looked like other than a tank. You know, and I, of course, my, I was frustrated, and my dialogue at that time was, we got tanks in the wire. That's all I can tell you. We got tanks in the wire. We need illumination. So we have tanks inside the wire. I repeat, tanks inside the wire. Over. Out. I do not believe that Quezon thought we had tanks. Quezon was also facing one of the largest attacks of the war. Three NVA artillery divisions had surrounded the base. Enemy guns pounded them day and night. Still, no tanks had been spotted. It was hard for Marine commanders to believe the NVA would use tanks against a small camp like Long Vey. As it turned out, even Long Vey had underestimated the threat. We didn't know how many tanks there were. We had so much confidence in ourselves, especially with the laws that we, we thought it would be a, a cakewalk. We really anticipated two or three tanks at the most. Eleven North Vietnamese tanks rolled right over the camp's perimeter defenses. With the laws misfiring, there was no way to stop them. We never expected that many of them. But the tanks just uh, overwhelmed us, just overwhelmed us. They broke into the inner perimeter and they were firing back into our positions from behind. And we really didn't have anything to, to take them out with. NVA infantry soldiers overran positions throughout the camp. Green Berets were dying and being taken prisoner. Siege troops were slaughtered at alarming rates. With the camp completely overrun, eight Green Berets and a group of indigenous soldiers took cover in the Tak. The underground bunker was their only refuge from the mayhem. Inside the Tak, Captain Willoughby and his men tried to regroup. Lieutenant Wilkins and Colonel Shungle took up defensive positions outside the bunker. The colonel had only been in the camp a few days. The army had sent him in to assess whether reports of NVA tanks were accurate. Now, Shungle had all the evidence he needed. The laws still weren't working. Hand grenades were their last resort. And I threw one, and it landed right underneath the the front track on the tank, it was close and it didn't do much damage, but it apparently irritated him. Shungle and Wilkins found themselves at the mercy of the NBA tank. One blast from its 76 millimeter main gun left the front of the talk in ruins. Shungle and Wilkins were hit. The NBA tank moved on looking for new targets. The two officers emerged from the rubble, wounded but alive. 55-gallon drums filled with rocks had saved their lives. Smoke poured out of the talk. Shungle and Wilkins believed the men inside must be dead. They searched for cover nearby before the next tank arrived. A short time later, Sergeant Thompson and his men worked their way through camp. The entrance to the talk had been destroyed. Oh, that was a mass grave. I saw that the minute I walked into it the first time. It was full of smoke, and uh, I didn't want to be down there. Thompson believed the camp commanders were all dead. He and his men quickly moved on. Eight Green Berets and a group of Sid soldiers were now trapped inside the bunker. 
The NVA returned, this time to finish off the talk. They tried to crush it by rocking the heavy tank on the roof. If it broke through, there would be no hope for the men inside. The concrete and steel bunker was built to withstand artillery, but there was no way of knowing whether it would stand up to the enormous weight of a tank. The tank crushed the main radio antenna and knocked out communications. The men in the talk were now cut off from the outside world. Without the radio, they would be unable to contact Khe San or Old Long Vey. Once Thompson realized there were men alive in the talk, he rallied his Sidge troops for a counter-assault. There was a group of people at the old camp. There was a group of people underground trapped in this bunker, and the rest of us running around on the outside. So we had to pretty much uh, do things on our own, you know, take the situation in hand. Thompson went after the tanks. He fired a total of four laws at point-blank range. The tank continued to advance. The fifth hit was too much for the tank to absorb. We'd see a problem and come together as a group and, and try to deal with it, you know. But uh, we just didn't have the resources. Outmanned and outgunned, Thompson and his troops were forced to fall back and regroup. The men in the talk were stranded. In the wake of the Tet Offensive, a U.S. Special Forces camp at Long Vey was overrun by NVA tanks. Eight Green Berets and a group of indigenous soldiers were trapped inside the Tactical Operations Center, or TAC. With communications cut off and facing overwhelming odds, they knew their survival depended on holding the bunker overnight. We thought uh, that if we could hold out to daylight, that a reaction force would come, we thought the Marines would send a reaction force, that aircraft would come in and, and that the NVA would pull off of the hill. They always have. In the past, they've overrun camp after camp after camp, and they've always left. In the meantime, the men in the talk had to fend for themselves. Captain Willoughby sent Sergeant Early and Specialist James Moreland up to the talk's observation tower to man the 50 caliber machine gun. Green Berets were badly wounded. Specialist Moreland sustained a serious head wound. Sergeant Early's legs were so mangled he couldn't walk. Medical supplies in the bunker were limited, and there was no way to get the wounded men out. Their only option was to hang on until daylight. My decision was that, okay, you know, the battle's over. We, we've, we've gotten our, our rear ends kicked and uh, we'll, we'll stay here and in the morning the enemy will have to leave because of our superior fire support, aircraft, uh, air support, and uh, we will hold the, the camp. That was basically all that was left to do. The Green Berets set up the machine gun and aimed it at the only entrance to the talk. But the NVA had no intention of leaving them down there. Lieutenant Min, the NVA commander, ordered his men to throw thermite grenades into the damaged entrance of the bunker. It's an incendiary grenade. It's hot. Uh, it's made to melt things. You can put it on an engine block and it'll burn right through the engine, drop out the bottom. As a fire raged inside the bunker, the Green Berets swung into crisis mode. They immediately began destroying classified documents and secret encryption gear. There was more at stake here than their own lives. If they had gotten the names of the agents that were supplying us information, uh, it would have been a disaster. If they would have gotten the information out of that, 
out of that talk, out of the safe of the people that they were paying for information, uh, and the people that were were working in villages and different places, they, they just go kill them. By the light of the fire, Lieutenant Longreer helped to tend the wounded. It didn't look good. Without medical supplies, all they could do was control the pain. Outside the bunker, Colonel Shungle and Lieutenant Wilkins found cover under the dispensary. The camp was crawling with NBA. There was nothing they could do for the men in the top. While the men were below the floor, two NVA soldiers were walking above them, looting the dispensary. The NVA were rummaging through the, the dispensary up above, looking for whatever, medical supplies or alcohol or whatever they might have found in there. And we, we just stayed quiet underneath there. But we could hear the NVA troops you know, walking around on the floor, which was probably only inches over our head. After what seemed like an eternity, the soldiers moved on. Underground, the bunker's concrete and steel construction prevented the fires from spreading. <coughs> the Green Berets endured the smoke and the heat. When the thermite grenades didn't work, Lieutenant Min ordered his soldiers to throw in tear gas. The Green Berets had prepared for this. During their extensive training, they had regularly been exposed to tear gas. Still, they fought to stay calm. The tear gas burned their eyes and seared their lungs. I don't know how I, I stayed. If you've ever been in the gas chamber, if you've ever been in the gas chamber where they use gas and they throw gas in there, you won't stay in there without a gas mask. You'll leave. Uh, it's what they use to disperse crowds, and that's in the open. We were in a bunker. For the SIDS troops, the tear gas was terrifying. They'd never been exposed to it before. The ones that didn't have gas masks, the rest of them had to put, you know, uh, their bandanas and lay down in the corner of the floor to breathe. And so then everything got real calm, and the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese hollered down in there and said, if you don't surrender, we're going to blow the place up and kill everybody. The SIDS soldiers panicked. They walked out of the bunker and surrendered to the NVA. I'm not sure what went on upstairs. There was a lot of confusion. You could hear a lot of shooting and a lot of talking, a lot of screaming. The South Vietnamese troops were shot as they surrendered. Troop strength inside the TOC was now reduced to just eight U.S. soldiers. One was badly wounded and barely conscious. Another couldn't walk. Still, they refused to give up. I really do not know how eight people, all Americans, made a decision without anyone discussing it with anyone to stay in that bunker and die. But we decided the decision was made without discussion that we were going to hang on, and we did. There would be no surrender. If they had to, the Green Berets would fight to the last man. As the tear gas finally dissipated, a voice called down to them in English. He says, anyone down there? And uh, someone said, yeah, we down here. And then he asked a question, something to the effect, do you have weapons? And uh, I, mean, I mean, antennas go up all around when someone says, you got weapons. That's a dumb question to ask someone. So someone at the end of the bunker come up with a comment. Yeah, we got some. Come on down. Probably teed them off. Because it was shortly after that, probably a matter of maybe a minute or less, they started throwing grenades down that same hole. <laughs> the NVA switched from thermite to deadly fragmentation grenades. The Green Berets were blasted with white hot shrapnel. This guy throws a hand grenade in, and uh, I holler, grenade! And I lean back behind the column, but 
I left my leg sticking out, not thinking, and a grenade hit me in the ankle. A, a fragment of the grenade hit me in the ankle. And someone said, grenade. And uh, you know, everyone covers their head and hits the floor. We didn't have helmets or anything. Uh, and that thing goes wham. And when it went off, this hot shrapnel was flying everywhere. And they threw about 30 grenades or 40 grenades. I don't even know how many, but there was a lot of grenades over a period of probably an hour. Wave after wave of grenades exploded in the confined space. The men bit back screams as shrapnel embedded in their flesh. They had to keep silent. They didn't want the enemy to know how many of them were still alive. We didn't no longer have control of our camp. Uh, communications was nil. Uh, I knew then that we were in bad shape. I, I didn't think I'd ever live through the night. I really didn't. I don't think anyone in there did. Under the dispensary, Lieutenant Wilkins and Colonel Shungle reinforced their position. There was nothing they could do to help the trapped soldiers. With grenades exploding all around them, the men in the talk would have to hold on until dawn. In early February 1968, the North Vietnamese Army overran the U.S. Special Forces camp at Long Vey. The underground command bunker was surrounded. The eight Green Berets trapped inside had survived tanks, thermite grenades, and tear gas. And yet they refused to give up. A half a mile away at Old Long Vey, Sergeant Ashley tried to call in air support from Khe San. But it was too dangerous for U.S. pilots to bomb Long Vey in the dark. They would have to hold on until daybreak. Sergeant Allen rallied the Laotian troops for a counterattack on the camp at first light. Of the hundreds of Laotian soldiers at the camp, only 35 agreed to participate. It would have to be enough. But when dawn came, Lieutenant Min and the NVA did not retreat as expected. Since tanks and grenades had not forced the U.S. soldiers from the bunker, they would try something else. The NVA packed the ventilation shaft with C4 charges. C4 explodes with 100 times the force of TNT. The men in the bunker could hear the NVA working above ground, but they had no idea what they were up to. Why we were trapped, uh, we kept hearing this chinking upstairs like it was like somebody digging with a, a, a bar. I thought they were repairing a tank because it was metal. And you can hear them clinking and clinking and clinking and clinking. This went on for hours, probably two, three, four hours. The NVA had filled the ventilation shaft with bricks of C4. The explosion was enormous. They set that thing off and it picked everyone up and threw them across the bunker. I mean, everyone. That thing went off. It, 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 it blew a hole in the bunker, a huge hole. Uh, it was unbelievable. The C4 caused more damage than the tanks and grenades combined. Nearly all the Green Berets were knocked unconscious. When I got, finally got my eyes open and uh, there was dust and stuff in my eyes, I, I was looking around, try, I, I couldn't remember where I was. You know, I'd been hit in the head, and, and I, I guess I had temporary amnesia for a minute because I, I thought, where am I? What, you know, what's going on? And, and I could see that light coming, and all of a sudden, I was, oh, man, I remembered where I was. The Green Berets had all survived the explosion, but now there was a gaping hole in the bunker. The men shook off the effects of the blast and used the light to their advantage. They searched the rubble for equipment, weapons, radios, anything that might have survived the explosion. We scrambled through there. There were radios with bullet holes in them and shrapnel holes in them, and they were just a total wreck. We found one radio with a bullet hole in it uh, that uh, we got a long antenna on it, uh, and I came up on the air. The battered field radio was just strong enough to reach the old camp and to communicate with the low-flying forward air control planes, or FACTS, in the area. We were asking for uh, the, the fact to contact k and get a reaction force on the way. Uh, sometime within an hour or two, uh, he gave us the sad news, which, I mean, we were humble, uh, that there would be no reaction force. And that, I mean, that your heart just sunk. Heavy enemy anti-aircraft and artillery emplacements between k and Long Vey made a rescue attempt impossible. 
they've said it's a trap, that they're leaving you alive so that they will come to rescue you. And uh, they said there's, there's only uh, eight of you left alive and it would kill more of them trying to come and get you. As men, they were devastated. But as Green Berets, they understood that Quezon's decision was a cold reality of war. The Marines were not coming. The NVA were not leaving. The men trapped in the bunker had but one hope left. Their fellow Green Berets. At first light, Sergeant Ashley and Sergeant Allen deployed from the old camp with a unit of Laotian soldiers. Their radio reports gave hope to the doomed men trapped in the talk. We got a call from Eugene Ashley, uh, Special Forces Sergeant who was with the Laotians, and he said, I'm trying to fight my way to you. Be prepared to come out, and because they're, they're putting all their attention toward me. So that redirected all of our energies. And, and fortunately, Ashley drew the enemy away from us being their only target. Sergeant Ashley and Sergeant Allen led their men in a fierce firefight as they worked their way to the hill. Allen and Ashley were ready to move onto the talk when they realized their Laotian soldiers had deserted them. Facing overwhelming odds, the two men retreated in a hail of bullets. Hospital. Despite the setback, the men in the talk rallied to the sound of Sergeants Ashley and Allen waging a two-man war on the NVA. I can hear him on the radio and a lot of firing going on. He said, we'll be back. Ashley retreated to the old camp. Now that it was light out, he could call in airstrikes over Long Bay. U.S. planes pounded NVA positions in Long Bay. Still, the NVA refused to leave. They took cover. Ashley was unaware that Colonel Shungle and Lieutenant Wilkins were still hiding under the dispensary. The only thing protecting them from the onslaught was a thin sheet of plywood. Plywood is not a lot of deterrent for the type of rounds they were using and there were a bunch of cans of uh, what were insect uh, repellent that were stacked next to it, which is a, had a petroleum type base. We were concerned that it was gonna hit those and the whole place was gonna go up in fire. So that's when we decided to go out from underneath there. Both men headed toward the old camp. Sergeant Thompson was on the opposite side of Long Bay. He tried to fight his way to Ashley's position, but NVA troops were everywhere. We ran down through there, trying to loop around to get to the old camp. Well, we weren't having much luck. There were uh, NVA kill teams were moving through. We saw that Ashley and uh, and those guys were trying to uh, assault their way into the camp to, you know, get the guys out of the bunker. We were just getting so much resistance, you know, that we we couldn't get down there quick enough. Now that they had air cover, Sergeants Ashley and Allen launched another counterattack. Sergeant Allen insisted on taking point as they fought their way to the bunker. He knew Ashley had a wife and daughter back home. So I started thinking about Ashley's ch uh, child, and so I, I told Ashley, I lied to him, and I said, Ashley, I said, look, you've got the radio. I said, so if I get hit, you can have me medevaced out of here. So I said, you stay behind me. As I bend down, I'm changing magazines in my BAR. Uh, I hear this round just kind of like whiz over my head, and Ashley just drops to the ground, just poof. And it, they hit Ashley uh, in the chest about where the button on his pocket was. My objective now had changed from saving some men in a bunker to saving this human being beside me. Sergeant Allen got Ashley out of the line of fire. He called for a jeep to take the wounded soldier back to the old camp. There he could be medevaced to a MASH unit for treatment. All of a sudden some artillery rounds or, or, or probably cannon fire from the tanks 
start hitting in the old camp, and next thing I know, blows me up in the air, and I'm being tossed around like a rag doll, and I see Johnson go down. Sergeant Johnson, the driver, was badly wounded. Now, instead of one gravely injured man, there were two. Alan knew he could only save one of them. The medic had to make a choice. The rule book says that you're going to save the person who's most likely to survive. Sergeant Johnson's wounds were grave, but less severe than Ashley's. Alan stabilized Johnson's breathing. By the time he made it back to Ashley, it was too late. I guess my biggest regret, it's like uh, trying to save life of a comrade and you don't succeed. Not being able to save somebody's life, that's what I've carried with me all these years. News of Ashley's death hit hard. The brave sergeant had given his life for his fellow Green Berets. Without Ashley, Allen could not mount a counterattack on his own. Once again, the men in the bunker were left at the mercy of the enemy. As the Tet Offensive raged on, a massive U.S. aerial bombardment led by B-52s and strike aircraft thwarted the NVA attack on Khe San. Six miles from Khe San, a North Vietnamese tank unit still held Long Vey Special Forces camp. Eight Green Berets had been trapped inside the camp's operations bunker for 14 hours. They were all wounded, some of them critically. General William Westmoreland arrived in Da Nang. The U.S. commander authorized air support for Long Vey and helicopters to evacuate the camp's American personnel. Colonel Shungle and Lieutenant Wilkins had made it to the old camp, a half mile from the Tok. The colonel was now able to order airstrikes on Long Vey's coordinates. He needed to move fast. The trapped men were running out of time. Lieutenant Longrier had had enough. I, I said, that's it. I'm going up uh, top of the ground and die like a man. I had 19 bullets. I was going to kill 18 people and then myself because I was not going to be captured. Okay, that's the reason I counted my bullets. So I, it was, to me, it was, it's immaterial. I didn't care if they had a plan or didn't have a plan. We weren't going to live. We were dead men. I'm going up. Long Lieutenant Longrier's decision galvanized the men. If they were going to die, at least they'd die fighting. Colonel Shungle was advised of their decision. Shungle was a tremendous combat soldier. He said, look, if you guys are determined to come out, we're going to have the, the airplanes continue to drop bombs for three passes. They'll pass over three times. Then they're going to continue to pass over dry runs. The plan was risky, but it was their only chance. Despite their wounds, the men would have to make it to Old Long Bay, a half mile away. And uh, I had real reservations about that. I, I, I was not in, if I'd have had a vote, I don't believe I'd have voted for that. Uh, I might have waited for dark. I'm not sure what I wanted, but it took a lot of um, uh, intestinal fortitude to, to crawl out of that hole and run across that hill with machine guns up there. A-1 attack aircraft took to the skies. The World War II airplanes flew low and slow allowing for more precise targeting of ordnance and machine gun fire. Lieutenant Min and his troops ran for cover. The aircraft made three heavy bombing and strafing runs. As predicted, the enemy was forced to take cover. The Green Berets inside the Tok prepared to evacuate. We're gonna make a run for it. Their chances of making it across the hill were slim. Soldiers who could still walk helped the wounded. They would be forced to leave Specialist Moreland behind. The young Green Beret had succumbed to his wounds. The men could tell by the noise overhead that the attack aircraft were ready to make their first dry run. Then it was up and out. Lieutenant Longrier took the point. 
and I'm looking to see if there's any enemy soldier moving around out there. I don't see any, but then all of a sudden, for some reason, I become aware of this airplane. And these A1Es are very slow and very low. I mean, they, they drop their ordnance in your, your spit can if you've got one. And I look up uh, just because of the noise. I looked right into the eyes of that pilot, and he leaned over and looked out his cockpit at me and smiled and dipped his wings. And he gave me a rejuvenation of I was no longer guaranteed a dead man. I now at least had a chance. chance was all he needed. Thanks to the airstrikes, enemy presence near the Tok was light. As the Green Berets made their way toward the old camp, Longrears scouted for hazards. Shungle had pre-positioned a truck at the edge of the old camp. The men rushed to choppers parked on the old camp's landing zone. Tanks and infantry moved in on the landing zone. Sergeant Thompson brought up the rear, struggling to make it to the helicopter. A mob of terrified Laotians clung to him, holding him back. The Laotians wanted to be evacuated, but there wasn't enough room on the choppers. Now the logic behind that was that uh, they would make an extra effort to get an American out of there. And if they had a hold of me, they'd go too. So I couldn't move, plus my back was hurt. So I missed the pickup ship by about 50 feet. The helicopter pilot offered to land again. Thompson said no, it was too late. The NVA had already overrun the landing zone. Sergeant Thompson was captured and taken prisoner. He spent five years in a North Vietnamese POW camp. Two and a half of those years were spent in solitary confinement, remembering the friends he lost at Long Vey. I saw some of the finest soldiers I've ever seen in my life up there. It was a, a defining moment in my life. And uh, oddly enough, I'm kind of glad I was there. And I'll probably be there for the rest of my life. In the Battle of Long Vey, both sides paid a heavy price. Every man on that hill, not one person broke and run. And when, when we were trapped in that bunker, there was eight people in there with no means really to resist. And we resisted and we stayed in there with gas, hand grenades, uh, demolition charges, uh, we just did it because we were, that's the kind of people we are. It was the resolve of the Green Berets under fire that kept them alive. Just getting the job done. You're there, you're assigned a responsibility. You know going in it, that sometimes your responsibilities are going to have to be accomplished under stressful situations. So it wasn't up to me to decide that this was a good day or not a good day to take care of my job, but it was my day to do my job. Of the 24 Green Berets at the camp, seven were killed or listed as missing in action. Three were taken POW. 14 made it out alive. Over 200 South Vietnamese and indigenous troops were killed. During the Tet Offensive, enemy losses were staggering. 37,000 North Vietnamese lay dead, 
including most of the Viet Cong's best fighters and political organizers. Many more were wounded and captured. They realized that uh, they cannot attack uh, a force of professional soldiers because uh, they're, they're not capable of doing the things that need to be done to, to frighten or overpower uh, the fighting spirit that, uh, that professional soldiers have. The American soldiers who fought off the invasion would never forget the lessons of Tet. There, there's a, they used to say there's a special forces saying that says you, you've never lived till you've almost died. Life has an excitement that the protected will never know. It gives you an appreciation just for what life is. For the Green Berets who survived the Battle of Long Vey, life and duty have taken on new meaning.